My name is Nancy Stephan and I know many of you, and I'm a professor in NGIT's Humanities Department, and I'm director of the Murray Center for Women in Technology. And on behalf of the Murray Center, I want to welcome you to this 17th annual Lillian Gilbreth Colloquium, co-sponsored this year by the NGIT Technology and Society Forum Committee, the Albert Dorman Honors College, the College of Computing Sciences, the NJIT Office of Technology Development, the New Jersey Innovation Acceleration Center, and last but not least, Sigma Psi. Um, before the program begins, I'd like to say a few words about the extraordinary person for whom this colloquium series is named, NJIT's first woman professor, Dr. Lillian Moeller Gilbreth. Lillian Gilbreth is probably the most famous person ever associated with this university, and yet she's famous for all the wrong reasons. If I told you that she is the mother in the book and films, cheaper by the dozen, some of you at least, at least the older people in the room, uh, uh, might know right away who I meant. But if I told you that she is the author of Concrete System, Motion Study for the Disabled, the Psychology of Management, and 14 other pioneering books in industrial engineering, you might not recognize who I'm talking about. Cheaper by the Dozen has made Gilbreth immortal, but at the cost of erasing all the traces of her intellectual and technological importance. Uh, NGIT's Gilbreth Colloquium is designed to correct that record and in the process to make visible the wide-ranging contributions that many other women have made to science, technology, and management over the years. Today, we're just beginning to recognize that the most important scientific and technological innovations take place at the interfaces of disciplines. Lillian Gilbreth understood that in 1911 a brilliant systems thinker who, was, thinker who was able to see connections across disciplines and disparate fields. Gilbert was the first to integrate psychology and industrial engineering, um, refocus the, refocusing the attention of engineers on the human element in work. Unlike the cheaper by dozen movie moms, Gilbert didn't believe in womanly self-sacrifice and didn't encourage it in others. She valued efficiency, but not because she was puritanical about it, but because it gave people back the time of their lives, time for things that interested them. Uh, she believed that when you choose something that really interests you, the, dis the distinction between work and play essentially disappears. She was passionate about her children, but she was equally passionate about her career, and that was at a time when women weren't even supposed to have careers. In short, in Sheryl Sandberg's instantly famous term, Lillian Gilbert wasn't afraid to lean in. If she were able to be with us today, I think she would be delighted with our speaker, Annabelle Bashiga is Chief Information Officer of TIA CREF, another pioneering woman who is passionate about what she does and adept at leaning in and leading forward. At TIA CREF, um, she is directing a major infrastructure improvement program and managing the integrity of company and client information. Under her leadership, TIA CREF's IT transition program is focused on improving the organization's technology services and web experience. Prior to joining TIA CREF, she was CIO for Bain Capital and its affiliates, where she was responsible for IT strategy across a global organization. Previously, she was managing director at JP Morgan, holding executive positions that include, included chief operating officer for Asia Pacific Foreign Exchange, based in Singapore. In 2001, she was recognized as one of Insurance and Technologies Magazine's Elite Eight. She's also a member of the CIO Strategy and Exchange, an invitation-only research board, CIO Magazines, uh, Executive Council, and Executive Women in IT. And she is the advisor for the Women Business Leadership Initiative at our rival school, Rutgers University <laughs> Business School. Without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to our 2013 Gilbert Colloquium speaker, Annabelle Bashiga. Thank you. Thank you so much, and it's a pleasure and honor to be here, uh, especially during Women's History Month. 
And I see some women in my audience here. Um, if you are a woman that is currently a student here at NJIT, can you please raise your hand? Okay, so I'm gonna give you all a homework assignment. You're gonna go and you're gonna find two girls in high school that you're gonna convince to have a technical career and go to college for technology. And so that, that next time that one of you is kind of up here in my seat, you'll see twice as many of you out there, okay? So if you could just get two, it makes a difference. All right, so um, to, today we're gonna, whoops. Well, it was working. <laughs> Hold on. There we go. So today, uh, we're going to talk about a couple things. One, uh, I'll give you a little introduction of myself and how I got to BCIO. Um, we're also going to talk about um, uh, technology over the last 30 years, and we'll have a little fun with that. Um, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about my personal background and also the tech roles of the future. Uh, I am not going to predict the future, but I'm going to tell you where I'm seeing some of the trends and, and what we, we think are, is going to happen. Uh, out in technology. So um, let's talk about me, how I started my career. I went to Seton Hall University uh, and got a computer science degree. And um, from there, I started my professional career at AT&T, and I was a Unix and C developer. And that was back in the mid-'80s before anybody knew what Unix and C was. Uh, it was an interesting time. Um, from there, I decided to go to Wall Street, 1987, I uh, joined a company called Quotron, which is a market data company, doesn't exist anymore. And uh, at Quotron, I was a Unix and C developer. I later became a manager there as well, uh, running some of the projects. But um, it, it was an interesting time because uh, back in the 80s, uh, we, we looked much different. Uh, it was the 80s, so everyone had big hair and big shoulders from the shoulder pads. And uh, we, women wore uh, business suits that kind of looked like men's suits, except they had skirts. And we had white blouses with big bow ties. And, uh, it, and we wore sneakers to work, and we put our shoes on when we got to work. And, uh, and I'll tell you, my first job, um, I was the only woman in the department. And I think we had probably about 50 people in our department, and I was the only woman, and I figure probably the first uh, Unix and C uh, woman developer on Wall Street. And um, very often the clients would come in and they'd ask me for coffee because they didn't, you didn't see professional women, especially in technology back then. So um, uh, later on, I left uh, um, Quotron, and I decided to get into some of the investment banks and work in technology there. Um, I worked uh, at Lehman Brothers, uh, Deutsche Bank, and uh, the longest was J.P. Morgan, where I spent 11 years, which included um, assignments in Singapore, where I was for three years in Singapore. Uh, doing several things, both operational and also technology related. And, um, and then I spent a year in Tokyo, um, and uh, also a year in Boston. And um, I have, through my career, supported many different business lines, all in financial services. I uh, have got my first divisional CIO role at JP Morgan, so I kind of kept sort of going up, learning and going. Um, my first divisional CIO role was at J.P. Morgan, and uh, later I went to Bain Capital to be um, their CIO, and that was my first corporate-level CIO. Um, Bain Capital is a private equity and alternative investment um, company up in Boston. And, um, and then I, I got to this job, which is at T.I. Craft, where I've been at three years. So um, that's my background. I have an undergrad in... Um, uh, in computer science. I have an MBA uh, from Rutgers, and uh, I also have a coaching certification that I got for sort of personal reasons, because I, I like to develop people and teams. Uh, coaching certification from the uh, Hudson Institute of Santa Barbara. So uh, that's my educational background. So now I'm going to um, take you to uh, the 80s. So <laughs> Technology in the 80s. First, we're going to talk about cameras. Um, 70s and 80s, you had these uh, Instamatics, which were cameras you had to look through, through a little viewfinder that had flash bulbs, and you put film in there. And, and after you took a bunch of pictures, you went to 
the store down the street to go. It could, it could either be the drugstore or some place that developed pictures. And in about a week or two, you got your pictures back and you realize that all the pictures you took were pretty bad and you have like one good picture out of the bunch, right? And, and, that was and, and then you got the little pieces of film to save in case you wanted other copies. You could listen to music with a Walkman, which meant you can listen to one cassette as many times as you wanted to. And sometimes you have to open up and flip it to the other side to listen to the other side of the cassette and carry this big thing with you. But then everything really changed because we got the PC. This is the first time that computing power could sit on the desktop. This was a really big deal because before then, you'd walk into an office and all you saw were telephones and typewriters on desks. So we got the IBM PC with a nice, beautiful green screen, no graphical user interface, no mouse. And uh, I remember what we used to do is we used to write these little programs. Um, so you'd have a startup script that would kind of scroll up and get, say, like number one, uh, spreadsheet, number two, word processing, number three, something else. And, and what you do is you press a number and you enter it. And basically, you had a little program called number one that would start up the spreadsheet. <laughs> and this is how you started programs on your computer. And I, I still remember 1983, the PC XT came out. 256K of memory. I said K, 256K of memory and 10 meg megabyte, megabyte uh, hard drive. And then what happened then is we decided to get into portable computers. This is what a portable computer looked like back then. 28 pounds, the compact portable. That keyboard used to fold in and clip into the, th into the computer. I mean, 28 pounds. I used to carry them around like this. You know, you put them in your car. You had to drive them pl someplace. You sometimes have wheeled them around in carts. Um, and then <laughs> everyone remembers how cool Gordon Gecko was in the first Wall Street movie because he, had, he was standing on the beach with his cell phone. Big brick. Okay, so... If you look at that, that's about as good as we got in 10 years. We go to 1990s. So in the 90s, you can see now we have a graphical user interface. We have a mouse. We have Windows. Look how young Bill Gates is, right? <laughs> we have Windows now. The floppy disk went from 5 and a quarter to 3 and a half inch, and now it is not floppy because what happened with those floppy disks is they got bent up and smushed. Now they're kind of hard, three and a half disks, three and a half inch disks. And then you started getting laptops and, you know, that look like laptops, cell phones that almost fit into a pocket, and other peripherals. Uh, this is a great ad that we found. Um, <laughs> you could buy a PC for under $7,000. Can you believe it? Under $7,000, you could get a PC with four megabytes of memory and an 85 meg hard drive. Wow. But then something really cool happened. Everything changed again. We got the internet. So now comes in search engines. Email. Before that, you couldn't email people. Personal emails, you could email within your company, but you really couldn't email. Like the average person couldn't email each other. You didn't have that. Now you start to have that. There's another cool thing that happened. Amazon. Online shopping. That really started to change everything. And I still remember, uh, gosh, it was late 1990s, and of course I was working uh, at J.P. Morgan, a big investment bank. And um, <clears throat> I remember someone saying, oh, yeah, sure. Look, you could buy books on the internet, but you never do banking on the internet. Never. Yet here we are. We know that we can take pictures of checks and deposit them, right? It was stuff that you couldn't even imagine. So that was the next 10 years. We got a little bit better. Now we look at the new millennium. Now these are things that all of you should probably recognize, right? <laughs> We've got Facebook. We've got the iPod, the iPhone, the iPad, um, YouTube. Uh, things have really progressed. And if you think about what's happened in these last 10 years compared to what happened the 20 years before, huge progress, and it's moving much faster. 
Um, this was kind of a cool slide that we found um, with some interesting information. So um, in 60 seconds on the internet, 13,000 iPhone apps downloaded, 168 million emails are sent, 60 new blogs are created and 1,500 blog posts go live. Over 70 domains are registered. Over 100 questions are asked on the internet. 695,000 Facebook status updates. 695,000 search queries. It's a lot in one minute. It all happens today. We thought this would be kind of fun. Well, what would have Twitter looked like in the 1980s compared to today? <laughs> so you see that 1980s version is kind of like, that, that's what Pac-Man looked like. So you can think of, of video games and the nostalgia there. Um, moving on. So, okay, so that's the past. So, so what's coming up now? What are the big trends that we're seeing? And we picked five big trends that we're seeing. Uh, one is big data. Uh, which is basically the analytics on structured and unstructured data to gain insights on customers and products. Mobile, which you all know, anytime, anywhere access. Social media, collaboration, both internally in your company, but also externally between the company and the clients. Cloud computing, which is basically an efficiency and a speed play. And then BYOD, which is bring your own device, or uh, I think the next step is bring your own computer, um, which is based on, uh, you know, a lot of people think it's about saving money. It doesn't really save you that much, but it's more around satisfaction of using what you like to use. And, um, you know, I, I think of uh, um, smartphones. I hate when we have to pick a corporate smartphone because, you know, it's like picking a shirt that everyone's going to like. Right? Some people like buttons, some people like t-shirts. I you know, would much rather get out of that business and let people pick whatever device they want to use. But then I have to think about, ooh, what about security? How do I protect my data? So these are some of the considerations as we go along. Um, uh, big data, some, uh, some numbers with this too. 90% uh, of the world's data was created in the last two years. 86% of consumers are willing to pay more for a great customer experience with the brand. 326 billion is the projected volume of e-commerce transactions in 2016. 190,000, this is important, 190,000 is the shortage of people needed to fill available big data jobs. So, um, as we look at big data, there's, there's roughly two types of big data. One is uh, um, the map reduction play, where you kind of take a bunch of data, stick it in with some analytics, and see what, what it tells you. And uh, uh, Google was actually the first big map reduction. I mean, they invented map reduction, and, and that's part of their search engine, right? So the other kind is picking a specific business problem. How do you develop analytics around your internal data? and then go out to, to the internet and, and get some information on you know, what you have internally on your clients versus what they're doing externally and put it together and try to get some insights on how to market or even risk management. Um, there, there was a, a, um, a funny story actually which was um, funny but a little creepy. Uh, I think it was in USA Today last year that um, Target had it's been doing a lot. They're kind of advanced in the big data space and doing some analytics ar around their markets. And, and they, um, <laughs> what happened was that apparently um, a father came in to complain because they found out that um, uh, his daughter, who was a teenager, was being marketed for uh, baby items, like diapers and other things. And he came in to complain about it. And he later came back to apologize because Apparently his daughter was pregnant and he did not know it. But, but somehow Target did. <laughs> because Target figured out the types of things that people buy when they're pregnant. <laughs> and so they were sort of marketing what you might need next after you have your baby. So um, um, uh, those are the types of things that uh, companies are doing. Um, uh, you know. Uh, questionable about whether they should be doing that, but, but they are the types of things that people are doing. Okay, so let's move on to mobile computing. Um, there are 6.8 billion people on the planet 
5.1 billion of them own a cell phone, but only 4.2 billion own a toothbrush. Uh, it takes 26 hours for the average person to report a, lo a lost wallet. It takes 68 minutes for them to report a lost cell phone. 25% of Americans use only a mobile device to access the internet. 30 million consumers watch television content via their mobile device. And 57% of US smartphone owners use mobile banking features. So you can see, um, and you know, I'm sure, cell, cell phones or mobile device usage, whether it's uh, tablets or smartphones, are becoming, it's becoming more prevalent, and, and I think it's going to become the predominant uh, device, if it hasn't already, for people to access the internet. So um, that's bringing on this whole um, new uh, way of looking at things from the corporate perspective of developing mobile first. So we used to look at things and say, hey, um, let's develop it on the internet, and then we'll figure out how we convert this to a mobile device. Now it's, well, let's do this on the mobile device, and we may develop it on the internet, but it's not converting anymore. It's thinking more mobile. How would you do it? Because it's different. It's a different experience, and, um, and plus it's, uh, it's actually even better because you're getting, them anytime, getting people anytime, anywhere, not just when they're plugged into a computer. Social media. Over 12 billion text and instant messages are sent per day, twice the world population. 49% of those who use social media daily would rather text than call a person. 78% of people trust what their social media site says about a product or service compared to 55% for TV and 49% for brand sponsorship. So what do you think is happening with marketing? A lot of marketing efforts are moving to the internet and social media because it's a more trusted place to be. And that's where people go. And, there, and there's also two types of social media. So there's how do you connect your company or your employees to your client? And then um, and there are ways and forums of doing that. And there's a lot going on in that space. But there's also internal collaboration. So how, you know, all of you, I'm sure, are using, you all collaborate on internet sites, right? Yeah? So, um, so when you graduate college and you go to work, you're going to want to do the same type of thing, correct? Right? So, so companies now are looking at how do we, and, and some are further than others, but how do we bring that um, collaboration that people are used to at home or when they're in schools into the enterprise and get more productivity out of it? Cloud computing, another big one. 90% of Microsoft's 2011 R&D budget was spent on cloud computing strategy and products, 90%. Cloud providers have increased personnel from nil in 2007 to over half a million in 2010, and that was three years ago, way more than that now. So there's a couple of things around cloud, and, and cloud is basically taking uh, your infrastructure or services, and it can be uh, applications, it can be um, uh, just the infrastructure, because there's infrastructure in the cloud, there are um, uh, many providers that provide that now, um, uh, so, you know, uh, I can name a bunch, IBM, Google provides it, Amazon provides it, um, and then there's applications in the cloud, so like Salesforce.com, big cloud providers, so they're full service, you just put your data in there and they have all the apps um, already running. So it's become really um, uh, a big uh, trend uh, because of a couple things. One is for the big company it's an efficiency play, um, maybe something that is managed more cheaply outside, um, goes over to the companies, I mean, goes over to the uh, cloud service providers, whether it's infrastructure or applications. Um, and that, and that means that in, in the enterprise, if you're outsourcing, then you need different people, you know, different types of skill sets. So uh, there's managing the outsourcer, and there's also building what exists at the outsourcer, so different types of roles. Um, for um, startups, it's a, it, it, it kind of removes the um, barrier to entry because startups now, what they do, and they, they don't have to build the infrastructure, they don't have to buy a bunch of servers and get, get the data center, they could just go onto Amazon and rent space for a while. 
And so it makes it a lot cheaper to do a startup. So those are the two types of areas that we're seeing uh, cloud get really popular. And one thing that you, know, you need to consider uh, if you're me and you're thinking about moving to the cloud is security and service levels. Right, so if I'm gonna put some important data out in the cloud, I have to know what the security is at these areas and also how they're gonna provide service because when it's somebody in my office who's my employee, it's a lot easier to get good service than it is somebody that is sort of external that I might not see. And then we have BYOD and BYOC. So bring your own device, bring your own computer. Um, the consumerization of IT, I think, is really pushing this. Um, we're finding that, you know, people come in and they want to use, like I said, you know, you can't pick one shirt that everyone likes. People want to use their own devices, and the security is getting a lot better. Um, uh, you know, as a financial services company, that's, that's one of my primary concerns, securing my client data, also adhering to regulatory uh, restrictions. You know, there are regulations that, that I have to retain a lot of information um, uh, because it's a requirement. And, um, and so all of that is getting a lot better. There are um, uh, new software packages. So, so for example, we actually have a voluntary BYOD. So if you feel like you'd rather use your device instead of maybe the BlackBerry that we have, you can bring in your iPhone or your Android and we'll put um, the corporate uh, email and contacts and even applications on there, but in a secure manner. So th that's what we focus on. The, the other thing that I think uh, will eventually happen is the, the BYOC, bring your own computer. Um, we're, I don't think anybody's there yet, but I've heard talk of companies moving uh, towards that. And um, uh, for bring your own computer, it gets a little more complicated because there's access and security around that, but, um, but I think it will eventually evolve that way just because, I mean, all of you, did you, need a, did you have to bring your own computer to go to college? You need a computer for college, right? You can't go to college without one. And I think, that's I think that a lot of high schools need you to have a computer. A lot of grammar schools are now starting to do that. So um, my guess is that uh, in time we will get there. There's just the security part of it that, that has to get worked out. So um, these are the trends that I'm seeing. Uh, been asked to talk a little bit about me and my background. So um, my parents, uh, my parents are both Portuguese and they came to America uh, in the 50s, 1950s. Um, I was actually born in uh, America, but uh, my first language was Portuguese because that's what I spoke at home. Um, So I grew up in a non-English speaking household. Uh, my brother, I have an older brother who is also was born and raised in Portugal. We still have our home there. Uh, and uh, you know, given that, I know if any of you are from an immigrant family, uh, there, there tends to be a job for everyone. Everyone has a job in the family. So as a child, I had a lot of jobs. So I was a translator as long as I can remember. Even in kindergarten, I was a translator. Um, I started paying bills in the third grade because I could write, that's when I learned how to write script. Um, I also learned how to type in the fourth grade because my parents thought, well, gosh, you're a great, you can speak English really well. She, you know, she could, she could work in an office and maybe be a secretary. And that was a big step up for us because, you know, before that it was a factory or um, labor for us. Um, so uh, uh, the interesting thing though is that all these things, pay, my, my typing has become in very useful for me. <laughs> getting into technology. And in fact, I think I made a lot of money in college typing papers too. <laughs> so, um, but a lot of these skills, you know, so when, when you look back, uh, you know, I didn't have a lot of role models for, um, uh, for what I do today, but I gained a lot of great experience from my family because I had to be a lot more responsible than any of my friends did at a much earlier age. So there are, there are benefits to that, and I feel uh, uh, actually very advantaged to having that behind me. Um, uh, but education, for me, became really important because my high school and my friends in high school made me want to go to college, and college opened up the doors of possibilities of what I could be. So um, um, I think that um, that has, has you know, uh, all worked out pretty well, but I, I encourage you to keep, I mean, you're all here in college right now, but keep going. Um, and uh, as you look at your career, 
things that you should think about are, um, first of all, there are people that know, some of you probably know exactly what you want to do, and some of you don't. Uh, I was one that did not know what I wanted to do. I kind of got into computer science because my brother suggested it to me, and I tried it and said, well, I kind of like this. It's, it's interesting. I love programming. It's kind of fun. Okay, so I, I kept doing it because I liked it. Um, it. You don't have to know where you're going to go. You have to just pick something, and I encourage you to pick something and try. Try things out. Um, I look at my, my husband. So I met my husband in college. He was a chemistry major. Today, he's a COO of a hedge fund, right? So things change. You have a long life ahead of you. <laughs> Don't worry about knowing exactly what you want to do today. I also want to talk about role models, mentors, and sponsors. That's a big part of how I got here, because I did not have role models uh, that were um, white collar uh, role models in my family or any of their friends. So that's what I learned and, and got to know when I got into uh, business and in my career. So uh, role models are people that you observe and you say, hey, I like the way that person does something. I think they do the right thing. I kind of want to be sort of like that person. It's good to look for role models um, and in what you want to be. And that helps you understand, too, what you might like to be. Um, mentors. Mentors are people that give you advice. And I would recommend that you have multiple mentors. I've had many. Not just one for everything. What I like to do is kind of, again, observe somebody. And if I like the way they do something and I like the way they think, I might come to them with a problem to solve or I might ask them for advice on what I should do next or what, what they think about what I am doing. So it's a good thing when you get out into the world and you start working, look for mentors. And then there's sponsors. Sponsors are people that help promote your career. You can't ask for a sponsor. They will find you. So um, if you are uh, creative, you do great work, you're looking to do more, usually sponsors will find you. And they tend to be senior people. They will notice you, and they'll, they'll promote you and, and uh, promote your career. So uh, three important types of people there. Uh, the next one, do what you love and love what you do. OK, I stole this off of my Life is Good mug. <laughs> but I love this saying, because if you do what you love to do, you will be great at it. It's pretty simple. If you try to do something that you don't love to do, you might be OK at it, but it's going to be hard to be great at it. So you need to think about that. Um, and then the next one is um, know your trade. Don't be too quick to move up the ladder. What I mean by that is, hey, you should absolutely be ambitious. You should absolutely want to accomplish what you want to accomplish. But you also need to learn uh, your trade. So um, as you look to be a manager, I, I actually understand what the people who work for me do. Because I've taken the time to understand. And I haven't done every single thing that everybody who works for me does, because it's a large organization. Um, you know, I grew up in the uh, application development side, but I interacted with people who did infrastructure, so I have never actually, you know, built a server, but I understand what they do. And I took my time to really understand that as I moved up, so I didn't just focus on, well, I want the next job, I want the next job, I want the next job. I also tried to learn, and that's important. So, um, so I would recommend that, too. And, and the other thing, too, is I, I kind of look at careers in decades. So I think your, your 20s, and plus or minus a few years, right? So roughly, your 20s is around experimenting and understanding what you like to do. So it's a great opportunity. You're, you're, uh, you're new. Everybody knows you're new when you get into a company. And so it's a great time to ask as many questions as you want, uh, to try things, try different types of, you know, whether it's programming or infrastructure or project management or requirements. You know, try different things. Because um, your 20s is really around you know, experimenting and understanding what you like. Your, your 30s is about picking something and, and really becoming better at it and becoming an expert at it. Your 40s is where you really want to think about, well, where do I want to go with this? Do I want to be um, a senior manager? Do I want to be an executive? Do I want to be um, an expert technologist? And, and setting a goal for yourself and, try, and, and moving towards achieving that goal. 
And then your 50s is where you really become what you want to be and start thinking about what you're going to do next. And you start over again. So um, it's my advice for career in the decades. And uh, moving on, we have tech roles of the future. So here are some roles that I think are pretty hot as you think about what you're going to do next. Big data, anything big data is really big because there's not enough people. It's a brand new space. So, uh, you know, I've, there's a new term or a new role called a data scientist. Um, if you're a really strong math person, it's a great place to be because there's going to be more and more around that analytics, getting better at targeting either marketing or understanding what works in a product. And, and it's a hard problem to solve. It's a big one. Uh, mobile, very hot. As I said, it's going to be the predominant way of accessing the, the internet and accessing companies. Nanotechnology, something I didn't really talk too much about, but um, there's a lot going on in robotics. Um, there's uh, also in um, sensors. So for example, uh, there's a, a bunch of companies up in Massachusetts now trying to compete to figure out how to turn a, a smartphone into a tricorder from Star Trek. Remember Star Trek? Where they used to just wave it over you. But <laughs> so basically, in effect, being able to uh, do some kind of medical analysis using nanotechnologies to analyze um, uh, bodies and sort of make, rec make recommendations to, doctor, to doctors, send that information back to doctors. So things like monitoring um, insulin or uh, cholesterol, your heart. Uh, also turning, turning that um, smartphone into something that can diagnose simple um, illnesses like colds or flus because um, uh, they've, they've predicted there's going to be a shortage of doctors in the world because the population is growing. And so uh, what they're trying to do is find ways to offload the easy um, illnesses off in a, in a different way using electronics around it. So there, there's a lot going on there. And then security is huge. There's lots of bad guys out there. Uh, and I'm sure that you've seen all these DDoS attacks and the news around them. Uh, you know, that's not going to stop. I think a new bad guy is born every day. So uh, security is going to be something that's really important to tackle. And then cloud we talked about. So um, that's what I had for today. You could take questions. And hopefully I can answer. <laughs> One of the trends that we hear a lot about is, you know, the Tom Friedman book, The World is Flat, and kind of the globalization of technology, where you can get everything you want almost from any place in the world. Can you talk a little bit about what perhaps we need to be thinking about to really proactively play in that global economy, both from a trying to get jobs standpoint, because a lot of perhaps what in my generation we might have gone to school to be able to learn to do as, say, a computer programmer, a lot of that work now is being outsourced to other countries. And what do we need to be thinking about so that we can proactively deal with the global economy? Mm -hmm. So um, there, there has been a lot of outsourcing offshore, but I'll tell you there's a lot of uh, insourcing coming back in, too. Um, so, uh, so I think that's a, an interesting thing that's happening where we're, we're calling it nearshore as opposed to offshore, right? So um, establishing development areas here um, in, in the country. So I think that's a, it's an interesting space to, to watch. And I think there's, um, there's actually, um, there is, there are not enough people in this country to do IT. There really aren't. And I hear the folks from California and Silicon Valley, every time I hear anybody talk about it, they say that they don't have enough people, not enough engineers, not enough people to, to do the work that needs to be done in this country. So I actually don't think there's a shortage. I know we've heard there was that whole maybe 10, 20 years ago, you had a lot of people moving offshore, and that still exists. But I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity uh, in the country for IT. Um, I think also that uh, the consumerization of IT is going to really change things um, and is changing things. 
So a lot of the countries that uh, did not have the infrastructure, so even if you look at Middle East and Asia where you didn't have a built up infrastructure like we do, uh, what they've done is they've skipped telephone landlines. They've just gone to cell phone. Everything's cell. So uh, it's much easier to install, much cheaper. And that means that uh, anybody can have a tablet anywhere and be, um, you know, a kid in Pakistan can be browsing the web just like we are, right? I think that English is becoming a lot more predominant language because of that, because the internet is, there's a lot of English on the internet. Um, so, I, you know, I think that, um, you know, as you look at job opportunities, there, there's a lot in this country, there's a lot abroad. Uh, I think there's still a shortage of, en especially engineers, not enough. Um, I'm going into medicine. I'm just wondering how will uh, this sort of stuff affect the healthcare system and everything like that? So um, interesting stuff in healthcare, actually. Um, insurance companies are investing a lot, healthcare insurance company investing a lot in big data. And uh, that's around sort of rationalizing their costs. So, <laughs> you know, looking for, um, I've heard things like uh, looking for the same service and price points in a certain area. So finding where the cheaper solution is and letting your clients know about it. Um, so I'm not sure that's good for someone who's going to the medical profession in terms of <laughs> making money. But, but there's a lot of interesting things, though. In, um, I've also seen that um, doctors using uh, video to maybe see more clients without actually having to go to the hospital so you can service more clients. I think the nanotechnology, so what I mentioned before, taking a smartphone and turning it into a tricorder. So if they can find, and, and they will because it's, it's an objective now. H how do you do that, right? So taking that uh, cell phone or that smartphone and having it be able to maybe take your temperature and a couple of or other um, um, uh, details from your body, you know, from sensors, and being able to transmit that to the doctor, and then maybe the doctor can then just transmit the prescription to the drugstore. It saves a lot of time. I also think of it, you know, when I had a, a child that was, uh, you know, uh, toddler age, you know, every once in a while you got the flare-up of a fever, oh my God, what do I do? Um, I think that those types of things can help a lot. So I think, uh, you know, it's a good profession to be in. There's not enough doctors. And, but I think y your life will also change. It'll be different. In my, in my intro, I, I mentioned, we did a lunch to uh, Cheryl Sandberg's new book about leaning in and moving towards your, your ambitions. Uh, and, and one of the things that she, she says, or asks us to ask, uh, I guess particularly the women, but maybe everybody do, what would you do if you weren't afraid? Well, you know, were, there, were there any times when you, when you took a risk um, in order to move yourself forward? Um, or any other you know, thing you want to talk about mm -hmm. that? Yeah, almost every time, actually. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I've taken risky roles. I've taken roles that nobody wanted. So I've taken them. Um, risky roles where it's been a really hard problem to solve, I've taken them anyway. Um, and every time, they've paid off. So um, I think that you have to understand yourself, and you certainly... I, you're more likely to, to move, move your career forward if you take some risk. And, and I think that as women, that's something that um, traditionally we've had um, problems with, is sort of stepping out. So, you know, a, a typical thing that we find is that um, uh, men will take the challenge and say, yeah, sure, I can do that. And they'll go, whereas women are like, well, I've never done that before. So? You probably, if you think you can do it, you can do it. But you have to take that risk. So I, I've, been, I've been big into doing that and into taking on a challenge. And I, I mean, for me, it's more interesting. And so if I've got a challenge, I know I'm going to just go in there and I'm going to get it done and find a way to get it done. Because you know what? No one knows everything. And uh, if you, you can find people to help you, you, you can ask questions, you can... Um, 
uh, get the skills that you don't have to do the job, but as long as you have some of some of the skills that you need, you don't have to have all the skills. So you don't have to have exactly done a job to take it on. You can absolutely take a risk, and, and I've done it. I mean, I, you know, I did it when I moved to Singapore with J.P. Morgan. I did it when I took on my first divisional CIO role at J.P. Morgan. I never had a CIO role before, but I said, you know, I would really love to do that. Well, I've never done it before, but hey. I'll, I'll, can I do it? <laughs> so I interviewed for it, and I got the job. And, uh, you know, sometimes there, were, there are times, and even today, sometimes there are times where I say, uh-oh, this is a hard problem to solve. Can I solve this problem? And um, I usually work through it. I bring in a bunch of people. We figure it out. But you have to have confidence in, in doing that. But I, I highly recommend it. If you, you know, move out of your comfort zone, that's how you grow. Um, as an executive, you're going to have to make a lot of the decisions every day, even tough ones, and then you have to communicate them. And sometimes there are bad news. I'd be interested in knowing how do you communicate the bad news mm -hmm. in a way that no one gets offended, and especially men don't get offended hearing <laughs> it from you. Um. You know, it, it's interesting when, when I think about, um, you know, so will men f feel offended? I, I never, when I'm at work, I don't think of myself as a woman. I just think of myself as somebody here that, that's here to do a job and get the job done. So I, I never have thought about that. When it comes to communicating bad news, um, I like to put it out there and just say it and keep it factual um, and communicate it. But typically, when I communicate something bad, I also communicate the solution. <laughs> it's useful if you can do that. Sometimes you can't communicate the solution because you don't know it yet, but you can at least say, hey, I need to tell you that this is happening, but here's how we're dealing with it. I don't have the answer yet, but here's what I have in place, and here's how I'm going to get to the answer. So I think it's important to either come behind that news with either the, the, the plan to get to the answer or having the answer, even better. And uh, people will get upset, and you just have to sit there, and sometimes they yell and scream, but it's OK. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, I have, so I have a little sister, and she's a senior graduating um, this year from high school. And I'm trying to explain to her that she can't make decisions based upon her, her emotions. So how do you? <laughs> how do you control your emotions and how do you make a wise decision even when you know you don't your emotions basically disagree with it yeah like how do you so so that's the um, experience part um, luckily um, you have to um, experience experience to get it right that's why they call it that so it takes time um, and luckily, because otherwise I wouldn't have a job, because all you folks know way more about technology than I do. I am certain of it. But what I know is all the things that can go wrong. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so, and that's an important thing. I think with emotions, you know, I look at myself 30 years ago, I'm a completely different person. So a lot of it is just a maturity that's gained. And, um, and I think it also has to do with uh, experiencing things going wrong. There are things that are going to go wrong. And I'm telling you right now, all of you will have things that go wrong because that's technology. Something's going to go wrong. Like, for example, I came in today. This was working, right? And then it turned off. But see, we have a backup plan. Right? So, so we learn from that experience. And I think that, you know, for your sister, it's going to just take some time. And in time, she'll, she'll learn how to control it. Hey, mm -hmm. can you just shed a little light? I know uh, when I was coming out of college, it's always difficult because you have the pressures of now being fully in the adult world, career, but you also have the idea you want to start a family. Can you speak a little bit about how you balance the two? Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, that, that's a tough one. But, uh, you know, obviously it's doable. I have a daughter, so it's doable. But um, what you have to do is you have to look at, you know, how you do it. And it's not going to be, um, you know, there's no cookie cutter 
kind of version of how you can have children and, and um, be married and be working, both working at the same time. But um, what I focus on is integration of my work and life. I mean, we all have mobile devices. We can get a way to do things with our kids. Um, I think that another thing you have to plan is how, how you know, whether you're going to do daycare or you're going to have a nanny or, um, you know, if you have a partner, how you split the role between you and your partner so that it's not all on one person. But it's very manageable. And, uh, and I think it becomes also a personal choice because, you know, there are a lot of people that stay home to have children. Uh, my best friend in the whole world stayed home to have children and raise them, and she did a great job, and it's a great thing to do. Um, I decided that I wanted to work. Now, uh, there are difficult times and times that things don't quite go the way you want. And uh, like, so in my instance, I, um, I, I brought my work to, to home and I outsource anything I don't want to do. So, um, you know, uh, in my house, I have people who kind of, you know, do my shopping, grocery shopping and unload the dishwasher. And because of that, there's always something in the wrong place in my kitchen and I can never find anything which annoys me, but then I say, well, wait a minute, you decided you're not gonna care about that. Okay, can I move it to side? And um, I, I pick the things that I really wanna do with my, uh, with my daughter, my husband, or my friends, and I try to get the things that are not as important out of the way or done in a different way. So there's online grocery shopping. There's, there's a lot of things now available that help, can help you do that, but it certainly takes some planning and it's not easy. And so, um, you know, you can't have the, you know, mom at home experience as well as work because you have to pick one. But you can certainly blend it a little bit and still have, um, you know, have it all work out. I mean, actually, my mom worked. Um, she did. She did not, she not work in an office, but she worked. And, um, you know, so as somebody who was raised by a working mom, what I can tell you is that um, you, what you got raised in is what you know. <laughs> like, I, I, I never think of like, wow, she wasn't home enough. No, she was home a lot, you know, but that's what I was used to, and it worked. It almost sounds like you had a really smooth career. Did you ever see that yourself moving in a vertical, not a, in a horizontal manner instead of a vertical up the ladder? Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, it wasn't that smooth. <laughs> so um, okay, so I'll, I'll um, when I was at J.P. Morgan, I moved to Singapore, and that was in uh, 1995. And I had been in technology, and when I moved to Singapore, I took operational roles. And um, I did a couple things. I was uh, I headed up credit administration for the trading floor, and then I became the COO of foreign exchange in Asia Pacific, which meant uh, technology and mid office and operations. So um, it was a whole different thing that I was doing. I was I was getting a really good view of um, an investment bank and how it operated, even though I was in technology most of my life, my my career, and. Um, and it was interesting because during that time, I saw some of my peers in technology back in the home office going up the ladder, and I was not. I was doing something sort of more lateral. Um, so, you know, at first, uh, I wondered, gosh, did I do the right thing? Maybe that was a bad choice. Um, but what's interesting is later on, I realized it was an absolute great choice because actually today, when I look back at those people that were moving up the ladder, I actually moved past them. And it was because I had a different experience because I got closer to how a business operates and I learned something really important then. So, um, uh, you know, it, that's why I say it's a great time when you're younger to kind of try different things and experience different things because when you put it together in your portfolio, it gives you a whole different perspective, you know, because I can, I can understand a business perspective a lot better than I could have if I hadn't done that. And at the end of it, I think I uh, went further up the ladder than some of, the, some of my peers who, who looked like they were going to pass me or were passing me. So I think you can't be too concerned with that. You have to go for what is... What do you really want to accomplish, and what, where is your interest? Anything, any other questions? Are we? Mm -hmm. 
So, so I'll leave you with this uh, last bit of advice. Do what you love, do your best at it, do the right thing, and have confidence in yourself.